Maddie Pup asks, can you do a video on the different types of brain scans and what each is used for? Sure thing, Maddie. And here are the timestamps if you want to skip ahead. We'll start with computed tomography or a CT scan or CAT scan of the head, which uses x-rays and denser tissues tend to block more x-rays and show up brighter. And this is an example of someone with a hemorrhage due to high blood pressure in the left basal ganglia, a hypertensive hemorrhage where the blood vessels burst and acute blood is dense than brain tissue and shows up very bright. We're looking at axial images so you can see the skull on the outside and the brain on the inside and we're looking from the feet up and so this is actually the left side of the brain with the hemorrhage and this could cause symptoms such as numbness or weakness of the right side of the body. Here is a left subdural hematoma where bleeding occurs in the subdural space underneath the meninges and actually outside of the brain but it can push on the brain. This is a complication often of of blunt force trauma such as after a fall and if it's large as in this case it could be treated with neurosurgical evacuation. Here is a subarachnoid hemorrhage where the blood occurs in the subarachnoid space under the arachnoid matter a different part of the meninges. You can see blood filling up the supracellar cistern and ambient cisterns around the midbrain. A subarachnoid hemorrhage of this type is usually the result of a ruptured brain aneurysm. CAT scans are also very good at looking at bone. Here is a parietal bone fracture on the right side you can see with slight displacement this is a transverse fracture of the left temporal bone you can see this clear line going straight through the temporal bone it's also possible to do a cat scan of a specific area this is a cat scan of the temporal bone showing a loss of bone or dehiscence near the superior semicircular canal in the middle ear a condition which can cause vertigo especially in response to loud sounds known as Tullio's phenomenon this can be treated surgically. CT is good at looking at the fluid filled spaces or ventricles. These are the lateral ventricles which are greatly enlarged in someone with normal pressure hydrocephalus, a condition where there's low drainage of the cerebral spinal fluid so they enlarge and push on the normal brain tissue causing symptoms such as gait apraxia where the feet appear to be stuck to the ground known as magnetic gait and also urinary incontinence and sometimes cognitive impairment. It can be treated by surgical installation of a shunt which drains the fluid. Here are coronal slices like this through the hippocampi, the areas involved in short-term memory formation, and they're significantly shrunken or atrophied in someone with Alzheimer's dementia. CT is also good at looking at calcium. This is a CAT scan of someone with healed neurocystocercosis, a healed parasite infection of the brain, and it forms these calcified scars as the immune system successfully fights off the parasite. This is rare in the United States, but more common in countries such as Mexico, Guatemala, and El Salvador, where pork can be contaminated with this parasite. However, it's a common incidental finding where I practice in Los Angeles, and many people have no neurological symptoms. This is Farr's disease, a rare genetic disease that causes accumulation of calcium in symmetrical areas such as the basal ganglia and can cause symptoms symptoms similar to Parkinson's disease. The related Farr's syndrome results from an acquired metabolic derangement such as from hyperparathyroidism leading to elevated blood calcium which can then deposit in the brain over time. In Sturge Weber syndrome, subcortical calcifications can form a so-called tram track sign. It's a genetic disease but it's a segmental disorder meaning the genetic mutation only appears in some cells of the affected individual. It can be associated with a birthmark known as a port wine stain. We will shift to MRI scans of the brain. In an MRI scan, a magnetic field is used and then a radio frequency pulse is delivered and then emitted by tissues back to a detector. And subtle changes in the microenvironment of the tissue changes how that radio frequency pulse is admitted, giving a different signal. So it's not simply a densitometer like a CAT scan. It can detect subtle different intrinsic to the brain tissue and can pick up pathologies which do not result in a change in density of the tissue. There are different times that can be allowed for the radio frequency pulse to be emitted and different software that can generate different sequences on the MRI scan to help the radiologist and neurologist evaluate different pathologies. A discussion of these different sequences is beyond the scope of this video. This is an acute stroke in the right temporal lobe, diffusion weighted image 
rotating on the right and apparent diffusion coefficient on the left. Due to swelling of the cells due to ischemia, there's lack of diffusion of free water causing this very bright signal. As the stroke ages, the signal characteristics would be different over time. In a right-handed person who's left brain dominant for language, this may actually cause relatively milder symptoms. This flare image shows multiple sclerosis, an inflammatory disease of the central nervous system with well demarcated lesions in the subcortical white matter, the paraventricular white matter, and juxtacortical areas. In this next image, gadolinium-based contrast dye is given, which can cross the injured blood-brain barrier and get in to the active plaques showing active inflammation. This MRI shows limbic encephalitis with swelling in the medial or inner temporal lobes and can be associated with certain detectable antibodies in the blood, such as anti-LG1. It can cause symptoms such as confusion and seizures, and early on it may be mistaken for a psychiatric disorder, though it can improve with immunosuppressant treatments such as with high-dose steroids. The aforementioned gadolinium contrast dye is excellent at visualizing tumors, which often avidly take up the dye. This is a right temporal lobe meningioma. A meningioma arises from the meninges, the coverings of the brain, and is actually extra axial outside of the brain, but if it becomes large, it can compress and injure normal brain tissue. This is often a neurosurgeon's favorite tumor because it can often be removed successfully with a good prognosis. Here is a pituitary adenoma, a usually benign tumor of the pituitary gland. However, if large, it can compress the optic chiasm, causing peripheral vision loss, and in some cases, it can secrete hormones, such as prolactin, causing inappropriate milk secretion, or growth hormone, causing gigantism, but in some cases, they could be non-functioning. In other words, they don't secrete hormone. This is a glioblastoma multiforme. It can evade the posterior aspect of the corpus callosum and extend to the other side of the brain causing a butterfly effect. This could be called a butterfly tumor. It's often associated with a bad prognosis, though treatment is getting better and there are rare cases of long-term survival. Here's a right frontal oligodendroglioma with a smaller tumor and a larger area of edema or swelling. And this is a right acoustic schwannoma, a generally benign tumor, though it can cause hearing loss on the same side if it becomes enlarged. MRI is also very good at looking at the meninges, the coverings of the brain, which normally have a slight amount of enhancement, but this is diffuse, heavy pachymeningeal enhancement that occurs with low cerebrospinal fluid pressure due to a leak of cerebrospinal fluid, usually a complication of a spinal tap, but it can also leak in other areas. MRI is also good at looking at old blood products. This is gradient echo sequence of MRI, you can get similar findings with the Swan sequence where older blood products appear dark. Note that calcium also appears dark on Swan and GRE. And in order to figure that out, that this is not something like healed neurocystosarcosis, you could look at a CAT scan or other sequences of the MRI. This is actually someone with cerebral amyloid angiopathy, a condition that's associated with Alzheimer's disease, but the amyloid plaques occur in the blood vessels causing them to leak out blood, causing multiple microhemorrhages, though they can be small and asymptomatic. And speaking of blood, let's switch from MRI to a study that looks at the integrity of the blood vessels. This is a CT angiogram. It's a CT scan, but contrast dye is injected into the vein prior to the scan so that it fills up the arteries and the blood vessels are much more visible. They're normally somewhat difficult to see. Here we're able to see an aneurysm or outpouching of the blood vessel at the tip of the basilar artery. These are the posterior cerebral arteries. These are the middle cerebral arteries. These are the anterior cerebral arteries. And an aneurysm typically does not cause symptoms, but if it ruptures, it can cause very sudden, severe headache. 
due to subarachnoid hemorrhage, hemorrhage in the subarachnoid spaces I showed you earlier, and it's possible to treat this aneurysm after or even before it ruptures. This CT angiogram shows an arterial venous malformation, an abnormal connection between the arteries and veins, causing a massive cluster of blood vessels. Normally you have arteries which form smaller and smaller branches and eventually form capillary beds, which then reform larger and larger veins and then connect into larger draining veins. But when there's a direct connection between the arteries and veins, you get this enlarged cluster of blood vessels, which can cause no symptoms, but there's a risk of bleeding into the brain. However, an incidentally discovered unruptured arterial venous malformation has a surprisingly lower than expected risk of hemorrhage. In fact, my own grandmother had one and lived to age 99 and died of other causes. Now we'll shift to catheter angiography. This is a more sophisticated technique for looking at the blood vessels where a doctor performs a procedure by introducing a needle into the artery of the thigh and threading up a catheter all the way up into the cerebral blood vessels and then injecting dye and taking pictures with fluoroscopy. And that creates these real-time three-dimensional images where the dye then can scroll through the arteries after multiple pictures, and it's really easy to see the pathology. And also, it's possible to perform interventions. So here you can see the internal carotid artery, which then forms the middle cerebral artery. These are the anterior cerebral arteries, and there's a massive middle cerebral artery aneurysm. Now, some incidentally discovered small aneurysms have a lower risk of rupture, but this is a very large, high-risk aneurysm, and on the right side, you can see an embolization was performed where foreign material was introduced to block off the aneurysm, hopefully taking away the risk of rupture. Here's a catheter angiogram showing an arterial venous malformation. I'm just showing a single image, but if you actually looked at the images, you would be able to see the dye entering the arteries, then entering the arterial venous malformation, and then directly entering the veins without going through an intermediary capillary bed. Next Next, we'll shift to venography. This is an MR magnetic resonance venogram. Now, magnetic resonance, when angiography and venography is done, it's typically done without contrast dye, and the technique uses the movement through the blood vessels for instance, through time of flight magnetic resonance angiography to create the images. I don't know the exact technicalities of how this is done. So generally speaking, CT angiography and venography, because it actually uses dye, is a little bit more accurate in my experience. Nonetheless, this is an MR venogram showing a blockage in the right transverse sinus. So here is the superior sagittal sinus and the left transverse sinus sinus, sigmoid sinus going down into the jugular vein, but the system is completely blocked off on the right side due to a clot. This can cause headaches, strokes, even brain hemorrhages, and is typically treated with blood thinning medications such as heparin. But be careful because the venous system is often highly asymmetrical, which could lead to some overcalls, false positives. Here is a CT venogram showing cavernous sinus thrombosis. So normally the cavernous sinuses, which is a venous structure, fills up avidly with the dye, but there are huge gaps here. This was actually a complication of a sinus infection in a teenager. This can cause symptoms such as a bulging red eye and cranial nerve deficits, such as numbness in the cheek or six nerve palsy. In other words, inability to move the affected eye outward Again, it's typically treated with blood thinning medication. Next, we're gonna shift over to PET scans. So with a PET scan, you're given a specific radioactive tracer which binds to a protein target. So we're looking for something very specific in the brain. It doesn't necessarily pick up the overall structure of the brain very well. So this is amyloid PET imaging where a specific tracer is given that binds to amyloid plaques. And here you can see on the left a cognitive 
relatively normal person with very low levels of amyloid in the brain. Intermediately is someone with mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's pathology who has some amount of amyloid plaque in the brain. And then on the right, someone who has Alzheimer's disease where they more avidly take up the tracer. Now, the CAT scan I showed you earlier that showed shrinkage of the hippocampus, that would be more typical in someone with significant cognitive impairment, advanced Alzheimer's disease, because there's a loss of tissue. However, it turns out that amyloid accumulation occurs around 20 years prior to the onset of symptoms, and in fact, actually peaks right around the onset of symptoms, and then actually can decline as the syndrome progresses. And so it may be possible to detect Alzheimer's disease early before the onset of symptoms and give an intervention then. Here's a different type of PET scan using a tracer called TSPO, which is a marker of microglia, a type of immune cell within the central nervous system. And this is a 48-year-old woman with multiple sclerosis. And this type of cell is different from the lymphocytes known to trigger multiple sclerosis. And it's believed that people who have this signal may respond better to a different type of medication than we're giving to most of our patients with MS. Here is a DAT scan, a special type of PET scan where a tracer is given which binds to dopamine transporters, which could be used to diagnose Parkinson's disease. On the right, you see a healthy volunteer with avid uptake in the basal ganglia, which contain the dopaminergic neurons involved in initiation of movement. But in someone with Parkinson's disease, there's much less uptake, though most people with Parkinson's disease are diagnosed based on the clinical symptoms. We'll shift again to fMRI or functional MRI. Here, a normal MRI scan can be fused with functional MRI where we can detect metabolic activity of the tissue. So things like uptake of blood flow and consumption of glucose. In this particular case, there's a focal cortical dysplasia, an abnormal area of tissue that is causing epileptic seizures. And the fMRI can be used to localize the exact lesion in planning for epilepsy surgery, so hopefully epilepsy can be sufficiently treated with surgery without injuring too much of the surrounding tissues. Here is the relatively rarely used SPECT scan, single photon emission computed tomography, which can give metabolic information of a specific region of the brain. So this is an example of someone with a rare genetic disease called MELAS, mitochondrial encephalopathy with lactic acidosis and stroke-like episodes, where people can have episodes that appear to be a stroke, weakness of one side of the body or loss of speech. However, the MRI scans show lesions that are not in specific vascular territories, and some people may have complete reversal of symptoms. And it turns out that this is actually due to metabolic failure of that region of the brain. And on a SPECT scan, we can see very elevated lactate in that region during the attack, though more commonly the diagnosis is confirmed with genetic testing in the modern era. Here's an example of a type of diagnostic test called cisternography, looking at the cerebral spinal fluid. And this is someone with a cerebral spinal fluid leak into the area of the right temporal bone and the right ear. On the top, we're seeing a CT cisternogram where dye is injected directly into the cerebral spinal fluid, not into the artery arteries or veins, and it fills up that subarachnoid space and then leaks into the area where the leakage is occurring so that it can be surgically repaired. Here's diffusion tensor imaging. This is where the diffusion or movement of water is detected, and we can essentially see where axons or nerve fibers are because we can see where that fluid is going. And then these beautiful three-dimensional images can be creative where we can see the white matter tracks, and you can see the corpus callosum, the white matter tract between the two hemispheres of the brain in the middle. And we can also see the integrity of the white matter. And this isn't really used clinically right now, but there's some preliminary research in chronic traumatic encephalopathy and in multiple sclerosis. So I hope that was informative. Of course, there were many types of scans I left out, like doing MRI scans of specific regions, like of the internal auditory canal to look for specifically an acoustic neuroma, or of the cella turcica to look look for a meningioma in the area, for example, and many other rare types of scans 
use primarily in research. If there are things I left out you think are significant, please comment in the notes below and let me know if you have any ideas or suggestions for other videos.